Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture, uh, BC 310 on church and ministry administration. <clears throat> so we're going to uh, get into our next lecture which is on culture, but I, I see Christopher's hand raised. So Christopher, if you have a question, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, yeah, so this is a question um, on on the communication uh, subject, the topic. Um, so when we talk communication, I guess uh, you know uh, in this in this time and age, uh, uh, communication is. Uh, uh, I mean, a, a large part of communication is done through social media, and um, uh, you know there are various tools that are that are available. Uh, with its you know pros and cons. And um, I see that, um, you know, there are, I mean, I was just doing a little bit of initial sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, research on, um, not research, but just to find out, you know, what is the kind of adoption of of Twitter in uh, by churches and uh, the use of Twitter, you know, as, as, a, as a sort of a micro, micro, micro blog mm. um, and, uh, you know, to be able to facilitate um, uh, discussion and communication. So just wanted to get your views um, on, uh, I guess, social media as a, as a tool for communication, mm -hmm. as well as, um, uh, you know, specifically around Twitter uh, and Twitter-like uh, sort of um, uh, messaging tools, yeah. Mm -hmm. um. And uh, sure, thank you, Christopher. Yeah, I can share with you just you know my thoughts on this. One is, I feel you know churches, Christian organizations should be free uh, to use whatever works for them. So, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, whatever else you know. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things we will be looking at when we talk about media and technology is to know what your audience is using you know so if example if a particular ministry is targeting the youth and if the their target audience the youth are engaged on a certain platform then definitely use that platform you know whatever's whatever that is uh, to communicate so in general that's my opinion that i feel that churches should be free to use whatever platform or platforms that are most useful to engage with the audience that they are serving. So uh, I have no issues, you know, personally, I have no issues of, uh, of whatever platform people are comfortable. Basically, your, your target audience is on that platform, so use it to communicate. And these days, people are on multiple platforms, so use that. Um, now, personally, at a personal level, I have stayed away from personal activity on social media just from the point of view of time. So I have an Instagram account. I follow only um, four people. That is the church, my wife, son, and daughter. That's it. So it's just a private account. I, I just use it to just see what they, you know, just be in touch with, see what they post and kind of things like that. But um, I don't have a Facebook account. I don't keep do my use my instagram i don't use twitter i mean i stay away from it simply because i don't have the time for it mm, but whereas you know obviously there are there are individuals and people who use it very well uh, and uh, of course they have great influence using these platforms which is good i'm not against it this is for me personally i don't have time uh, to do that but instead what we've done is we let the church media team handle it so you know, our Facebook, church Facebook account, um, Twitter, Instagram, uh, we let the church media team handle it. And actually a lot of it is automated. So we've got background scripts running that automatically post, uh, you know, for example, every day there is this daily devotional. The daily devotional video, the background, we have background scripts that run that automatically post on Facebook, uh, uh, and I think Twitter also. So some of it is automated, some of it is manual. So those things happen. Now, you know, 
how much of an engagement people have. Again, people have various engagements and so on. So we uh, are not pushing so much on the social media. We, we have uh, the church, I mean, has Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. Like I said, some of the posts are automated through background scripts that run every day. And some of it is manual, like, you know, we have a particular event or whatever they, those things are done. Uh, so my answer is, yeah, use, you know, perfectly fine to use whatever is useful, relevant to your audience, and use it as as well as, you know, as well as, as, well as you can to engage with people. Yeah. I hope that helps, Christopher. Um, okay. uh, Elisha, your question, please. Okay, Pastor, thank you very much. Um, please, what do you, what can you say about um, ministers who um, uh, allow social media account managers to manage their individual private accounts for them? to engage uh, the public community and their congregation. Uh, some, some have found it a way to employ account managers. So uh, looking at the schedule of the minister himself, he may not have the time to go onto those accounts and to engage his audience. So they employ somebody who does that on their, on their behalf. Um, what do you think about that also? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, Elish, again, I'm just sharing my personal thought. I, f I don't find any problem with that. I think it's perfectly fine because, you know, we have been doing it, say, in uh, non-digital forms of communication. So in the past, if you look at, you know, um, promotion for a conference, promotion for an event, uh, lots of other areas, uh, the, in the, the, the Christian leader or the Christian organization would engage people who understand event management to do that for them. You know, they won't do it necessarily themselves. They have somebody, do, they had somebody doing it. So we do it in, this, in the context of other events. So when it comes to digital media, social media especially, sometimes, uh, it could be either the lack of skill that is you know how do you how do you keep current with you know all the things that you need to do good work on social media so lack of skill or lack of time you know okay i don't have the time you may have the knowledge and skill but don't have the time so then what do you do the the, the good thing to do is to engage somebody who has the knowledge the skill and the and and, and they're dedicated to doing this and uh, in many cases you know, it, it does, you know, given where we are today in the world, uh, people enjoy scrolling and reading these kinds of things and, you know, seeing the pictures and they feel connected to that ministry or to that preacher or minister. Um, and uh, so that's a good thing, you know. So, uh, so personally, I feel it's perfectly fine as long as the people doing it, you know, the brand managers, uh, they do an honest job. You know, they shouldn't see the tendency is always to exaggerate. The tendency is to make the online person bigger than the real life person. You know, so so brand managers and marketing managers can go off on a tangent, and then they make this online person look so great, so you know, amazing, which is very different from the real person, you know. So as long as we tell people, hey, keep things real, keep things plain and simple, and, you know, if you do that, then I think it's fine because it's just a practical thing to do. Uh, and uh, there are people who have the skills and knowledge to do that. Those are my thoughts, yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. for this. Thank you. Kennedy, how do you archive your communication at APC? Any advice, please? Um, now, are we use, um, so example, uh, so a, a, a lot of our communication happens through email and through WhatsApp. In times past, we 
used SMS, but now because of government restrictions in, in within India, uh, we can't use SMS very much. So we've you know we've had to move to e. I mean we've been using email and uh, WhatsApp. Now for email, we use a mail list so mail list server. It's called it's an open source product. We use PHP list. So all every email we send, mass email, is already is archived right there. So it stays there. We can go back and uh, look at all our you know whatever we've communicated by email. Same thing with WhatsApp. We use an online. Uh, web-based service called Vati. It's a very well-known uh, service, uh, Vati.io. And again, everything is archived there. It's on the cloud. It's archived. So all our emails and WhatsApp messages that we broadcast are archived in these cloud in these in the cloud with using these systems. The PHP list is something we ourselves manage. Uh, we run it on uh, an Amazon service on Amazon Cloud. Uh, the Wati is a paid subscription, and that's a hosted uh, service for us. So we do that. Uh, all our other online uh, example, all for example, all that we have on YouTube is duplicated in um, uh, all our videos are also not getting are also duplicated on Vimeo. So. Uh, all, all the videos that we put out are, are, are available, are, are replicated in the background automatically on Vimeo. So they're, they're also stored there on both these servers. And um, um, some other things we ourselves archive, right? So all videos are on two platforms, YouTube and Vimeo. We'll get into more of these things uh, in the other course. Yeah. Is that okay, Kennedy? Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions before we get into talking about Avni? You have a question, please go ahead. So, Pastor, when uh, while managing a team, you're dealing with uh, some kind of lack of discipline and commitment from the people. So, you want to communicate it being soft, you know, uh, and being uh, stern both together how do you communicate in such a way that you see the change coming or change happening because you know um, people if they are not responding to your message they are not willing to give time they are not understanding the value of punctuality and uh, taking taking the responsibility they as a volunteer they want to serve but they don't want to take responsibility they just want to do it in their own terms perfectly so how do to deal with such a situation. Mm. Right. So every shepherd has a rod. Right. So, like Paul writes to the Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter four, he says, "Do you want to come? Do you want me to come in gentleness, or do you want me to come with a rod?" And give you the exact verse. I think it's verse twenty-one. First Corinthians chapter four. Um, yeah, verse twenty-one. You know, First Corinthians four, chapter four, verse twenty-one. So he asks the Corinthians, "What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod, or in love and a spirit of gentleness?" Interesting question. So Paul is asking them, "You know, how how do you want me to deal with you?" Um, do you want me to be you know loving and gentle or do you want me to deal with you with a rod which is basically being strict and stern and so on right so every shepherd or every leader of course should be loving and gentle but the leader also should know when to use the rod which is discipline which is being strict and you know bringing Taking action that that brings correction. So, um, so especially dealing with volunteers or dealing with teams or staff or volunteers, you know, we are dealing with them with love and gentleness. 
but then whenever necessary you have to use the rod that is you have to be you have to take disciplinary action that's what the rod symbolizes so that means um, example example um, if you if you you know you're you're dealing, you're you're leading a team you're telling people hey we need you to be punctual it's fair to follow the three strike rule you know we talked about it i think in staff man that means two times i will tell you lovingly hey you know you're supposed to be here at example nine o'clock or whatever the time is but you came at nine fifteen. Uh, or whatever, or you didn't come, or whatever there is. Once, feedback, loving and gentle. Second time, loving and gentle feedback. Third time, say, hey, you know, this is happening, so we would like to request you to please take a break. Uh, we will give this respons responsibility to somebody else. And if you want to be involved, Please demonstrate, you know, please show us that you can come on time for the next whatever, you know, one month or period. You give, you're giving them an opportunity to come back, but it has to be after they meet the criteria, right? So what happens is when you do take that disciplinary action, then everybody in the team sees that, hey, there is a standard that's being maintained. It applies to everybody. No, there are no exceptions. The leader also follows the same standard. Everybody, thing. but then we have to use the rod, meaning take disciplinary action, and then the team sees that we are serious about our work, our ministry. There is loving, there's love and gentleness, but there is also discipline when, whenever you know somebody doesn't follow the the required uh, standards and so on. So that will set an example that everybody understands, and then everybody begins to follow but if you don't do the discipline then everybody thinks there is only love and gentleness and that there is no rod but that's not biblical you know every shepherd has a rod every leader has been given the authority to bring discipline it's okay all right good questions uh, I see another question from Roshan in regards to social media communication what is not to exaggerate the online person with the real one. What is it not? So, okay. So, Roshan's asking the question um, What is it not exaggerate the online person with the real one? Okay. Okay. So, I, th I think I understand what you're saying. Um, that means we need, you see, the, the, the default tendency in whatever people post online is you're creating an image online and people are relating to the image that you've created online the persona or the person they think you're online as opposed to who this person really is now on the one hand there is a lot of limitation with online Post. You can only post a video, or you can only post a, a a picture, which is all these are small time frames of your life. You know, maybe a still shot or a 10 second video, whatever. They are not so people are just seeing that. They're not seeing your whole who you are, right? So what happens through many small still shots, that's pictures, or many short videos, in their minds, they are forming a picture, of forming an understanding of who this person is. And that's the brand image. That is the persona that is being communicated through social media online platform. Now, that is an obvious limitation of social media, right? You, you can't, they can't see your whole life. They're just seeing bits and pieces of who you are or what you do. Um, 
So now we want to keep that as, as real as possible. It's very difficult because the tendency is always to project the good side of the person. Right. So let's talk about Christian ministry. So when a person does a video of, let's say, you know, uh, example, I'll tell you one example. Uh, so suppose a, a preacher went to a particular place and he had a one-day meeting. Okay. So he had a one-day meeting in that place. Now, the brand manager, whoever's handling his online presence, creates a two-minute video to highlight what happened that day. And I've seen, and I think all of us have seen these kinds of things. So the video, you know, makes it look so great. Wow, they're showing the whole city coming, you know, the person coming into the city. And then they show just snapshots of, you know, him laying hands on the people. People are falling on the floor, uh, this, that. You know, so in that two minutes, it looks like, wow, something great, you know, and, and they could, you know, they could show pictures of the city, this, that, and they could say the city was changed forever. Uh, you know, many, many lives were touched and or whatever. They could say all these things in that two minute video. And so what is the impression that's given? The impression is given is, oh, this was a powerful meeting that shook the whole city, whatever. The reality could be very different. Right? The reality could be he came to a place where there were maybe 50 people sitting in the in the hall, and uh, you know he preached, and yeah, they laid hands on a couple of people. People may have fallen to the floor, but that's what's presented in the video. They're not showing, you know, you can angle the camera in such a way that you're looking at a section of the crowd. It's not showing that there were actually only 50 people in the hall. The camera's angle as though it's you know it's part of a very big crowd, whatever. And um, and so on. So, so what is the impression left with the viewer? The viewer thinks, "Whoa, the massive meeting happened, whatever." But it could have been very simple, you know. So instead, what I like to do is I like to say, state the facts. Hey, we went to so and so city. We had we did four sessions. We taught on these are the four topics we taught on. We had an average of 50 people attend. We also prayed and ministered to people. There were there was one person who was saved. There were there were three people who received healing. Uh, one of the healing was from this condition, and there were five people who were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's that's an accurate report, as opposed to that two-minute video that uh, gave an exaggerated picture of what happened that day. Right. So, what's happening? The online has to be as close to the real as possible, and there's just one scenario that I've shared. You know. So how you create that two-minute video and what you put in that two-minute video can leave an impression on the viewer which may be true or may not be true, right? The correct way to state that, give the report on that day's ministry is, hey, we held a meeting in this place. There were 50 people there. This is what we taught. This is what actually happened, as opposed to if you create a video with you know wonderful music and showing all these graphics and pictures and they can leave a great wrong impression of what happened then the online person is very different from the real what happened just example like there's so many things are so many other things you know uh, can be presented online which are very different is that okay um, yeah all right go ahead elisa or yeah Pastor, I think what you have just said is very, very true. That um, it's it is observed largely across many Christian ministries. The online communication we keep. Yeah, yeah, that's true. With the public. It's, it's an area we all must pay attention to and
Yeah, Elijah. Yeah, your your voice was breaking a little bit, but I think uh, we got what you were saying that we we need to, you know, keep things honest. Yeah, um, Christopher, you have a question, please. Uh, yes, Pastor. No, so I guess just to extend, uh, uh, you know, um, you know the communication that happens in social media. Uh, I mean, it could be uh, you know informative, and uh, it could uh, you know uh, provide um, uh, a view of um, you know what uh, you know what a church could stand for. Um, uh, it could it could also it could I guess extend to also towards you know providing opinions providing um, uh, you know um, a more uh, uh, I guess um, clear sort of message about you know some things that ha may be happening in the world some you know events that are taking place um, and um, again uh, you know. Not sure how much of it that is actually done by priests, but I mean it could it could also be you know it could be you know in, in the in the in the realm of um, of morals of you know of, of certain um, events that are taking place which are not uh, you know not um, uh, you know right in, in in you know from a point of view of of, of uh, the Christian faith. So I, no, I just wanted to understand the uh, you know how what is your view on um, Perhaps how you know if this is happening already. Um, what do you, what do you think? Um, you know, uh, where are some of the limits? Where are some of the boundaries possibly that uh, that churches can uh, can keep uh, in providing a a more active uh, uh, presence uh, in providing opinions and also being able to you know to provide a uh, a, a moralistic view of you know what is right and what is wrong. Mm, mm. Okay, yeah, this is a very, very big question, Christopher. <laughs> uh, let me try to be uh, concise to the point. So, First Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen, the Bible tells us that the church is the pillar and upholder of truth. So the church is called to uphold truth in the world, in society. That's part of our calling, part of our responsibility. But we have to be very careful how we go about doing that. We have to be very careful. So the Bible also tells us, Ephesians 4, uh, I think verse 15 tells us to speak the truth in love. So you must speak the truth, but do it in love. So we're not doing it to hurt people, push people away, or to say that, you know, we are better than you. No. We are upholders of truth, but you, you have to communicate that truth. We've got to speak the truth in love, in a way to, that draws people to the truth, not push them away from the truth. That's one thing. Secondly, we must clearly understand the difference between spiritual action, social action, and political action. Right? We shouldn't try to do through politics what God called us to do through the Spirit. And we shouldn't try to do through social action what God called us to do through the Spirit. So what has happened in the Western Church is they've got all mixed up. And this is my opinion. You can agree with me or disagree with me. It's fine. But um, I feel, and I've been observing what's going on in the Western Church, it's all mixed up. Yes, the Church is called to uphold truth, but there's a proper way to do it. So, in terms of acting politically, I think the way to do it is that we need godly people who will take their places and do a good job in government. You see? But not by 
letting politics use the church. That is very wrong. Or not letting politicians use the church. The church is not a tool in the hands of politicians. The church is a tool, it's a vehicle, an instrument of God. So that's where things have gone wrong in the Western church. The church has become a tool in the hands of politicians. That's the wrong approach. What should we do? The church must take its place in the government and they must do a good job of serving people. That's the way we be salt and light in the world. And the church must express truth, but express it in love. How? You teach the people the truth. So that communication, of course, could happen through the preaching, the teaching the word on Sundays, through the written page, but always do it in love, not in a way that hurts people or drives people away, but draws them to Christ. You know, social action must be taken with the same thing. You know, so we engage with society in a meaningful way to draw people to Christ, not to drive them away from Christ. So again, here, uh, social action uh, in, has been misused, and uh, you know the church has gone wrong. You know, so we can. I mean, there's a there's we can get into the details of it, but you know, at a high level, my uh, response to your question is yes. The church is called to speak the truth. You're supposed to do it in love. And how do we do it? Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They must see your good works, not they must see your violence or not they see your hate, not that they see your, you know, forcing your views on our people. No, they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So our communication and what we do should be towards that. I hope I address your question because it's a very big question. Okay. All right. Um, anything else? Good questions? Okay, let's uh, move forward. We're going to change subjects now. But, uh, we may not be able to finish this, but we will get started. The next lesson is about culture, which is uh, a very important part of a Christian ch church or organization, uh, Christian ministry. Okay, and we will introduce this topic and. Let's think through on this together. It's this. So when we say culture, what do we mean by culture? You know, if you say culture among a particular community, you know, your example, you go to a particular village or you go to a particular community of people uh, and you say, you know, this is their culture. What do we mean? We are saying that this group of people, they share certain values, or they have certain values and practices and standards and traditions which they hold in common. You know, of course, gently we would talk about culture in terms of language they speak, the food they eat, uh, certain things they do, and so on and so forth. But we're talking now in terms of an organization or a community of people. Uh, and we're looking at it from a spiritual perspective. So we're saying that among these people, within this organization, this is the way the pe these are the things that the people value. Uh, this is the way they go about their day-to-day -day life, things they practice. Uh, these are the standards of things they adhere to. And these are the traditions. That means these are the things they keep, or customs, they just, just keep doing it over and over and over again traditions okay so that's what we're talking about 
when we talk about culture. And so when in, in the context of an organization, you know, your church, local church organization or the congregation, it's these jointly held beliefs. It's these uh, values, practices, rituals. Uh, it's the way of behaving and thinking. And it's the way things are done. And this is how we do it here. Right? So the, this forms the culture of the organization. Now, of course, in a very large organization, whenever you have hundreds and thousands of people, there could be subcultures. That means there is this overarching culture. This is how the whole organization uh, you know, uh, works together. But within departments or within areas of ministries, there could be subcultures, which are aligned, of course, to the overall culture, but they have their own expression or how they do it could vary a little bit, and that's fine. Now, culture is also dynamic, which could change over time. Right? So it could, you know, it adapts itself over time, uh, and sometimes it could be due to external or internal changes that take place. The culture of the community, the culture of the organization, can keep changing, depending on how it is formed and shaped over time. So what we are interested in is that. In the workplace culture, so you know, as an organization, people are coming to work in the church, in the Christian organization. So in that workplace, there's got to be a certain culture. And also in the congregation, you know, we want to shape the culture, you know. Uh, so we're talking both in the context of the organization, the church, the place where people come to work, and also in the congregation. So for example, if you look at APC, you know, we have about um, 30 people, staff, who work together here locally. Uh, we have lots of consultants who are working remotely. Uh, but at least in the, the group of people who are coming together and working, uh, there's a certain culture that dictates or directs, you know, influences how we work with each other. And then there is the congregation, the, the people who come and worship together and are growing, journeying together spiritually. Amongst us, there is a certain culture so we need we want to talk about this and talk about how to shape this and how to protect you know what the kind of culture that we want to maintain now why is this important because the culture affects you know when you talk about workplace culture it affects overall employee experience so the church staff when they come they work they should enjoy their work. They should have a good experience day after day when they come together and work. And this will, of course, determine productivity. You know, are people being productive in their work? So on. And that will affect how people are served, how the congregation is served. And it also protects the organization from negative influences. So, you know, if, if bad uh, a toxic culture comes in, people can get hurt, and so on. So you can think of um, the culture, organization culture, as the organization's immune system. You know, just a, just a, just as figuratively speaking, it's like the organization, as the culture is strengthened and a good culture is developed, it's like a good immune system. It can keep the uh, bad things, the infections, bad things out, you know, or if it, infections do try to come, it can overpower it and get it out. Yeah. So culture is really important. You can picture it as the immune system of the organization. So let's think now about what shapes the culture of the organization. We're going to, you know, develop this little by little. But how is the org? culture of the organization shaped. You know, this takes place over time. But very important to the culture of the organization is the leadership. The leadership has to model the behavior that you want the, uh, uh, model the behavior which you want to be formed in the culture of the organization. Because people just follow the leaders. People follow the leaders. They, you know, if the, they, they imitate the leadership. So 
the leadership behavior must be consistent with the cultural values of the organization. You know, so if the leadership models servanthood, then everybody else on below the leader leadership will choose servanthood as part of their culture. Let's serve. It's not about status. It's not about position. No, let's just serve. Whatever I need to do to serve, I will do. So if the leadership models humility, people will imbibe humility and will follow that. Humility will be part of the culture. If the leadership demonstrates openness, honesty, people will say, hey, it's this is the norm. Be open, be honest. That's the culture we have. Right? Now, I don't want to put everything on the leadership, but this is where it all starts. So leadership at all levels, starting from the leader of a department, the leader of a ministry area, leader, you know, all the way to, you know, in the church setting, the senior pastor, every, everyone, you know, starting from the senior pastor on down, if what the leadership models, that's what's going to happen in the organization. Or if you want to put it like this, you reproduce after your own kind. You know, that's a law. That's that's what God set in motion in Genesis. You reproduce after your own kind. So what's in you will get reproduced in the people who are following you. So leadership is very important uh, in 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 shaping forming the culture and in, in in really expressing what are the values what are the practices what are the what is the behavior we want people to have within the organization now this is a big area this is a big area because what we are what we have seen and you know, I don't want to sound pessimistic here, but in churches, if the leader behaves like a celebrity, a superstar, what happens? We have a celebrity culture within the organization. What is you know? What do you think a celebrity culture looks like? Well, you know, you have to hold this leader, and you know, like he's a superstar. He's, he's, he's way up high on the platform. You can never question him, uh, you know, and everything is there because of him, you know, in him, through him, and by him, this whole church exists, you know, so all those kinds of things. And uh, we have to protect him, he, you know, even if he does anything wrong, don't show that to the world, because if he is hurt, the whole organization will be hurt. He or she, I'm just the whole organization will be hurt. So they have to protect this leader and the superstar. Now the problem is the whole organization then becomes begins to have a celebrity culture. Uh, the leader, you know, uh, does whatever he or she wants, says it does, and the organization is there just to protect the leader. Then it trickles down. Everyone in the next level will expect the same thing from those who are under them. They also behave like celebrities in their own little spheres of influence, and they expect the same kind of treatment that their leader is getting. Um, so they act like mini celebrities and so on, and goes on down. And that's a very, very toxic culture. It's a very dangerous culture. Sadly, that's happening in the Christian church. Right? And uh, what we are seeing, or have already seen, is in those kinds of organizations, there's a lot of moral failure, mismanagement of funds. The leader is not accountable to anybody. Uh, the leader can say anything he or she wants and gets away with it. Ultimately, things collapse. Why? There was a culture of ce a celebrity culture. And that's a very that's not the kind of culture that should be in the church. You know, Jesus made it very clear in Matthew twenty. He said, "You know, he's, you, you know, the disciples were saying, you know, who's going to sit on your right hand on your left?" And then Jesus says, "You know, look at the world, look at the Gentiles, look at their leaders. Their leaders lord it over them, 
but it will not be so among you. In other words, he's saying, don't follow that pattern of leadership that you're seeing in the world, which is a celebrity, superstar, dictatorial type. No. In among you, in the church, among God's people, it's reversed. Whoever will be great, this is Matthew chapter 20. Whoever will be great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever will be first among you, let him be the least. Yeah. So the leadership style or the leadership culture is reversed in the church. And uh, you know, it's so clear in Matthew chapter 20 that you know you even wonder why our Christian leaders have overlooked that, you know, why we as pastors may overlook that because he's told us it very clearly, don't pattern yourself after what you see in the world. It's going to be different here. And here it's being a servant. Here it's putting yourself in the least position. And that's the way you lead in the church. Right? But the point I want to present here, first thing, what shapes the culture? Look at the leader. Things flow from the leadership. Okay. Let's pause here and let's, and we have a few minutes. I want to just give some time to take questions. Okay. Lars has a very good question. This is a very good question. How do you balance honoring the leader and making him a celebrity? Very good question. Because it's very difficult to draw the distinction in our minds. The Bible teaches us to honor our leaders, to honor those in authority, to honor those who serve in the word of God. You know, you read about this in Galatians chapter 6, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy, uh, First Thessalonians chapter five. It says, "You know, let those who minister labor in the word and doctrine be worthy of double honor." So the Bible is telling us, you know, those who are preaching, teaching, ministering the word, give them double honor. You know, so the Bible is teaching us honor those people, honor your spiritual leaders, which is very important. But. We cannot let them take the place of the Lord Jesus in our lives. So how do you balance that? Is, is, we need to make it very easy. So I think that whole thing starts with the leader himself. The leader is responsible for how the people treat him. So the leader should communicate to the people. Yes, you know, there is honor and respect, but don't make me a celebrity. Because in the minds of people, it's very hard for them to draw the distinction that, yes, I honor my leader, but I, how, where do I stop? Right? It's difficult for them. So therefore, I feel that this should come from the leader. The leader should tell the people, this is where you place me and do not place me like this so there are some intentional things that we can do and i'm not saying you know i'm going just going to share something that i do but i'm not saying you should do this these are things that i just practice right i'm not saying everybody should do this i'm just saying but the reason i do these things is because while I understand the importance of people honoring me, I also understand that they should not treat me like a celebrity. So for example, in the church, in our services, we don't have any special place on the platform for leader, any leader to sit. So no leader sits on the stage. Everybody is on the floor. Just And we did this from the very beginning. Why? Because we're all here. To worship God. So it's a very simple thing. Basically saying we are all on level ground. We are here to worship God. Second, I carry my own Bible and my own water bottle. Now I you know I don't need a, an assistant to carry my Bible or my briefcase. And no. I will do it myself. Third, when I travel, you know, I go someplace. 
people will want to, you know, to all these specialists. I say, hey, no, I will handle, you know, I will carry my own baggage. I will carry my own luggage. I, I won't let I won't let you let you do it for me. Why? I'm just telling them, look, I'm as ha human as you are. As long as God has given me two hands and two feet, I will walk. I will carry my own luggage. I don't need to be treated, you know, in any special way. Um, if I need to take the broom and sweep the floor, I will do it. You know, and I've done it. You know, in fact, last Sunday when we went to church, it was there was certain areas of a mess. Uh, everybody was doing things. I just went. I picked the broom and I swept the floor. And people said, you know, for, for me, it was demonstrating that look, I'm your senior pastor, but I can take the broom and sweep the floor. It's not a problem for me. And I did it last Sunday. You know, so what am I communicating? I'm telling, yes, I'm your leader, but you don't have to treat me like a celebrity. So that, I think, is the most important thing. And if the leader tells the people, just treat me like a normal person, then people will honor the leader without making him into a celebrity. Elisha, you have a question? Uh, thank you, Pastor. Not necessarily a question, but uh, uh, something to add up to what you just said. Uh, I believe that um, in our days, Christian leaders have created for themselves more uh, celebrity status, more than servants, leaders. Uh, because if you look around mm -hmm. what is going on in the Christian ministry, uh, for example, the, the scenario you gave about the sitting arrangement, okay, sometimes you see that um the congregation are sitting on different chairs and the senior pastor will only be provided with a different kind of chair to sit on in the church uh, sure. it's, it kind of gives a celebrity a celebrity status and it causes the junior pastors uh, to be envious they keep on slandering one another because each of them want to get to that standard where he will be celebrated. So I believe that Christian leaders need to do a lot of work on ourselves. Yes. The, as for the congregation, if you allow them, they will celebrate you. But the, the onus lies on you, the leader, to cut uh, that status from yourself and remain a co-equal with them, a co-servant of the Lord. Thank you very much for, for your inspiration. Mm. You've shared with us. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Elisha. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I feel that there are a lot of things that, and I agree with you, there are a lot of things that we as leaders can correct to keep people, you know, from making us celebrities and just honoring us as servants of God. Yeah. We need to honor servants of God. We need to honor each other. But they we, they shouldn't make us celebrities. Last question here, Kennedy says. Then what is the value of a helper in your case? So you know I don't have a personal assistant uh, or a helper because for now you know I'm able to do things, and of course we do we do have a lot of church staff people. But then they, uh, you know. The answer, the short answer to your question, what Kennedy would be, those around us who are, help, who are helping us should do things that we are not able to do for ourselves, right? I'm able to carry my own Bible. I'm able to carry my luggage, and, uh, so I can do that myself. What I do, cannot do, you know, or what we need help with beyond our own abilities, that's where people step in, help, do the thing, do those things. But you know, if I have one person carrying my mobile phone, one person carrying my Bible, one person carrying my water bottle, and they walk around me like bodyguards to escort me to the stage, that's like over the top. You know, a, the president of a nation may need bodyguards because of who he is in, in importance um, and for his protection. But hey, for a pastor, you know, to you carry your own Bible, carry your phone, and carry your water bottle and go up the stage, you know. Uh, those things the pastor can do himself or herself. And you don't need helpers need to do other things that they can't do for themselves. 
that's my thought yeah um, anyway I think the bottom line is in order to prevent celebrity culture as leaders we need to let people know that don't treat us like celebrities just treat me like a normal human being and of course God has given me a responsibility to be a leader and to serve and uh, that's it honor that honor the anointing honor the call of God but in all other senses forms we are just plain simple human beings that's it okay so let's wrap up we will continue this next week uh, as we talk about culture um, next Thursday Friday just a minute um, I'm gonna be in Delhi and I, let me just look at this very quickly um, I've got to do this before the class. Yeah, I'll, I will. That's fine. So next Thursday, Friday, uh, we will do our lectures. Then I, after that, I travel. It's okay. Good. Let's close in prayer. Could somebody please pray with us and dismiss us, please? Father, Go ahead. We, thank Go ahead, you. we thank you for you are source of all wisdom and knowledge, Father. And as we read your word and surrender ourselves, Father, lead us into an obedient life to your word, Father. And we thank you for Pastor who is taking time to teach us such beautiful things about Father. And as we learn them, help us to serve you more faithfully and more joyfully in days to come, Abba, Father. In all things, we give you glory, honor, and praise for who you are and how you are leading us. We thank your holy name. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and have a wonderful wedding. Say, God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you.